Okay, so we'll start with lesson one, which is based on the first two sections of chapter one of college physics. And the chapter starts by talking about physics and science, and it goes into a little history of uh, Newtonian mechanics, which is what we're, we teach in Physics 131. And it starts with Galileo, who was born in 1564, died in 1642, who laid the foundation of modern experimentation uh, in science. And so you know that if you drop a hammer and a feather at the same time, the hammer will fall immediately to the ground, while the feather will float softly to the ground. Well, Galileo uh, discovered that even though these are different uh, weights, if you if could get rid of air resistance somehow, both these objects would fall at the same rate, okay, and they would they would drop to the ground at the same amount of time, which would be basically the feather is being supported by air resistance. So if there was no air, you could drop the feather and it would fall the same same rate as a hammer. And he also discovered that once an object is moving along in any direction, there's no force needed to keep it moving. Its own inertia keeps it moving. So these are two sort of uh, maybe non-intuitive ideas that you can figure out using careful experimentation. Now 1642, the year that Galileo died, happens to be the year that Isaac Newton was born. And Isaac Newton wrote the Principia, which uh, mathematically put down a lot of... Uh, a lot of the same ideas that Galileo came up with and included three laws of motion and the law of universal gravitation and there's an old story that uh, Isaac Newton was sitting out under an apple tree uh, staring at the moon and wondering what force could keep the moon going in a circular path around the earth and then an apple fell down and hit him on the head and he thought wow, there's a force pulling that apple towards the center of the Earth. Maybe that same force is reaching out through space and pulling the moon toward the center of the Earth as it orbits, which is correct. So Newton's laws of motion and gravitation correctly predicted observed motions of planets and comets in their orbits, uh, mostly around the sun. So that's a bit of history. Um, the scientific method which we use today is described in the text, and they give four steps. The first step uh, of being a scientist is to make careful observations of the world around you. Keep your eyes open, um, you know, measure things carefully with rulers or stopwatches or thermometers or whatever. Uh, become familiar with the trends, uh, what are the repeatable phenomena, and what are the previous discoveries. So you need to become an, an expert on some something. Maybe it's frogs. If you just keep looking at frogs and measuring them and looking at them, seeing what they do. Uh, so two, you use some sort of mathematical model, some theories, to generate a hypothesis about whatever you have some exp expertise in. So this is a prediction that you could test. Uh, and then you perform experiments which test out your hypotheses. And you design your experiments so that they might prove your hypothesis to be wrong. And then uh, you look at your results. If you have to ref refine your hypothesis or change your theories a little bit to match the experiments, then you do that, and you can uh, maybe come up with new predictions or new questions, and of course publish your results. And that, and you kind of keep doing this, and that's that's the whole idea of doing science. So in physics, we're going to start by talking about how we make uh, measurements of distance and time, and uh, and also mass. So in terms of distance, someone might look at a map, for example, this map, it's a treasure map, I'm trying to find where the X is, and you, the map represents some real, uh, real mountains and some real terrain, so there's a scale, and the scale is listed here as one cable, and this guy's looking at it thinking, but wait, how big is a cable? So uh, measurements of physical quantities are often expressed in, are always expressed in terms of units, which are standardized values. So without standardized units, it would be extremely difficult for scientists to express and compare measured values in a meaningful way. So for length, our standardized unit uh, is the meter. For mass, the standardized, standardized unit is the kilogram. For time, it's the second. And 
the fourth one is electric current has a standard unit of the ampere, which comes up in physics 132 and subsequent physics courses. So it turns out that all the other physical quantities, like uh, speed, for example, can be uh, expressed as algebraic combinations of length, mass, time, and current. So for example, length divided by time will give you uh, uh, speed. And also, if you wanted to talk about charge, you take the ampere times the second will give you a coulomb of charge. So you can combine these to, to measure any physical quantity. And so units for those uh, for, that, are, that use com combinations are called derived units. So let's give it a try. You've got a football field, which has a length of uh, 100 meters and a width of 60 meters. It's a rectangle. The equation for the area of a rectangle is length times width. So what is the area of this football field? Take a look at these answers. I'd like you to pause the video for these give it a tries. Think about it. Choose an answer. And then resume the video and I will tell you the answer. So please press pause. Okay. So the answer is 6,000 meters squared. So clearly 100 times 60 is 6,000. That's what all the choices were. But you've got meters multiplied by meters. And so you would say uh, 6,000 m times m or meters squared. So a meter squared is a derived unit. It's a unit of area as opposed to meter, which is a unit of length. Now the second. So time is one of those things that passes by and we don't think about it that much, but you can certainly measure it using a stopwatch. And uh, an atomic clock will use as its little ticking the vibrations of a cesium atom. And it turns out that there's about, uh, million, there's about 9 billion um, ticks of a cesium atom in one second. And they've even defined the second to be this integer number of cesium vibrations. Once you've got a second, you can define distance, uh, the one meter, as being the distance that light travels in one over 299 millionths of a, of a second. So this is, again, an integer, and it's defined as, by the, once you've got the second, you can define the uh, unit, basic unit of length in this way. And the light has to be traveling in a vacuum because if it's traveling in, in air, it travels a bit slower. The kilogram we has doesn't have a very uh, fundamental definition, but it's defined as a comparison to an actual platinum iridium cylinder, which is kept uh, in a, a vault in Paris. And there are exact replicas of the standard kilogram uh, kept in various places around the world, uh, including there's one at the National Research Council uh, Meteorology Laboratory in Ottawa. Metric prefixes. So each power of 10 in this uh, metric system represents a different order of magnitude. So capital G stands for giga, which means 10 to the power 9. Capital M stands for mega. Capital K stands for uh, kilo, which is a thousand. Okay, so you may have heard of these in terms of kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes. Uh, centi means a hundredth, milli means a thousandth, micro means a millionth, and nano means uh, a billionth, one over uh, one over a billion. And this little letter right here is the Greek letter mu, which stands for micro. So for example, 0 0.01 meters, another way of describing that is 10 to the minus 2 meters, and that's a centimeter. So sometimes we have to convert from one unit to another unit. For example, we might want to convert 80 meters to kilometers. Well, you can use a con conversion factor, which is a ratio expressing how many of one unit are equal to another unit. So we're going from meters to kilometers. We know that there's a thousand meters in one kilometer. So uh, you can write the units that we have and then multiply them by the conversion factor so that the units cancel out. Example, 80 meters. I multiply by a conversion factor equal to one. So one kilometer over a thousand meters equals one since those are the same. And I've set it up so that meters in the bottom cancels meters on the top and you end up with 80 times one divided by a thousand uh, and you get in kilometers. And it's, if I do this in my calculator, 80 times 1 divided by 1,000, I get 0 
So let's give it a try. Uh, imagine you know your height is 65 inches and you want to convert that to centimeters. And you know that an inch is the same as 2.54 centimeters. So you want to take 65 inches and multiply it times a conversion factor. So that conversion factor is either going to be 2.54 over 1 or 1 over 2.54. So which one is it, A or B? So please press pause on the video and resume when you think you have the answer. Okay, so hopefully you chose A, 2.54 over 1, because your height H is in inches, which is on the top. You want to have inches on the bottom to cancel these out. And then centimeters is left on the top. So and when you multiply it out, you get 165 centimeters.